Good afternoon and welcome to another installment of Low Intermediate English Conversation with Professor Kent Lee. Uh, I think around this time you're still working on your midterm assignment, so we, again we're going to do something a little bit light. I mean, we're sort of starting the next unit, but not quite. Um, the next unit on our agenda has to do with kind of business workplace English and then maybe doing some company analysis. Um, and I, I'm not an expert on business, but I think this is really important uh, for you because many of you are going to get jobs in companies with your English major. Your English major will actually, uh, most of you are English majors, uh, and that will make you competitive actually. You may not realize it, but it can make you competitive on the job market if you know how to prepare for it, uh, especially if you're getting a job at an international company and, and doing international business. And so we're going to talk about some relevant skills for that in the beginning of this unit. Uh, and even if you don't go into business and company jobs, this is still relevant for you. You might be working in a research job, a government job, NGO. This is all still relevant. Uh, some of you might go on into an academic uh, track, like further studies in graduate school for a master's and PhD. Uh, maybe working in academic context or education or teaching. And again, uh, this stuff will be relevant to you too, uh, what we're going to do in this unit. So first, let's talk today about uh, certain kinds of skills that are relevant to the workplace, not just a business or corporate environment, but probably any workplace situation where you will find yourselves in the future. What do you think are some important workplace skills for your day-to-day -day functioning on the job? Whether it's an office environment or some other workplace, what are some just some important general workplace skills that you need for probably most any kind of workplace? We're going to talk about one today, which might surprise you. But first, I want you to think about this. What are some general kinds of daily workplace skills and business skills that you need uh, for any work environment, most any work environment. Pause the video and discuss this for a while. Okay, I was preparing for this unit. I thought I'd start by talking about certain kinds of skills. So I did some searching on, on some uh, websites and uh, the kinds of skills, that, general skills that uh, are discussed on, on websites, kinds of skills that most people will need for a typical workplace or business career. And, and again, there are all kinds of specialized skills for certain kinds of jobs like financial analysis, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, I want to focus on just general skills that would describe most any kind of workplace. So here's some that I found as I was searching, and these make sense. No matter what kind of job you have, you need time management skills. You have to be able to manage your time. And that goes along with kind of self-discipline, disciplining yourself, uh, managing your time, managing your own uh, schedule, your needs and desires, and, and such. Uh, from just about any job, unless you can find a job where you can work alone, you're going to need teamwork skills working on some kind of a team and probably leadership skills. Sometimes you have to, you know, take charge of a team or lead a meeting or, or, or move up to a management position uh, or an, edu uh, an administrative position. That could be true of, you know, education fields too. Analytical and problem solving skills, that makes sense. So you need good analytical and problem solving skills. Communication skills, of course, and there's a lot to, to say about communication skills. We might go into that uh, later. And along with that, for many jobs, negotiating skills, whether it's negotiating your salary or negotiating on a project or engaging in negotiating negotiation with a business partner, uh, people from another company, uh, things like that. Now, to these, I would also add work-life balance. I didn't really see this on a website, but from my own experience in working, 
um, that's really important. You need to be able to balance your work life and your personal life. You don't want your work life to consume all of your life. Uh, so, you're, you, so you don't have you know, a real personal life. You need a life. If you don't do that, you're going to burn out. You'll have physical health problems, psychological health problems. It's not good for you. Um, Work-life balance is really important. And it's one that's not really talked about enough still. And now there's one more uh, that I, I came across in web, one website, and I thought this was interesting. It mentioned memory skills. That's interesting. But you know what? It makes sense. For just about any job, you need to uh, have a good memory, a decent memory, for various reasons. It could be like remembering what things you need to get done. Uh, sometimes you can't just depend on a written schedule. Sometimes you don't have time to write something down. You need to just remember it. Uh, and sometimes you need to remember things that, you know, uh, that are kind of hard to put into schedule. Like, um, it could be things I need to do this for the boss by 3 o'clock tomorrow. And it could be uh, things like things you, you just need to do during the daytime, during the, the work day. As well as remembering key details, uh, for your work projects, um, things you need to do and uh, accomplish, uh, various things you need to remember in order to do your job. Uh, not just scheduling, but maybe important details, important ideas and concepts you need to learn uh, for your job. Or even if you're a student, this is relevant. You need good memory skills as a student. So how can you improve your memory? Oh, let's pause for a minute. That's a good question. How can you improve your memory? Think about that for a minute. Pause and discuss. Okay, how can you improve your memory? Well, some basic things. Actually, getting proper sleep. Uh, a proper lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle. That's actually important for your memory. Sleep is really important because um, regular sleep is really important for your brain. Your brain needs sleep, including proper dream cycles, because all of that is important for the brain to manage all the information. You've taken in a lot of information during the day, and experiences, and, and knowledge. Your brain needs deep sleep, and even dreaming. Dreaming is part of this information management process. Your brain needs that in order to kind of, what we'll, what we say, consolidate information, kind of what you've learned today or experienced today, you need to kind of consolidate it or combine it with your past memories and your, your general knowledge, what you already know. So your brain needs to figure out, oh, where does this go? Where does that go? And that's one reason your dreams are so strange. Your brain is playing around with different kinds of connections and where things go. Uh, your brain needs that to clear its memory and to refresh. Um, we also need good exercise. Uh, exercise is important for memory, maintaining good memory. And there's research, plenty of research that shows this, especially when you get older. Exercise is an important regular lifestyle, good food. If you eat too much sugar, that's not good for your brain function, for example. So just taking care of your health and proper sleep, that's kind of a basic requirement for good memory. Reading a lot, uh, keeping your brain active, uh, not just for work, but just on your own. Reading a lot, uh, keeping your brain um, active, exposing your brain to new information, new ideas, new concepts, keep learning stuff. When you finish college, you still need to continue learning, whether it's through reading or or you can also listen to educational videos or online courses, but reading is the best thing for your brain. Uh, so just reading a lot, train, keeping your brain in good shape. And then maybe some of you mentioned memory tricks. So I want to talk about that today. Actually, I want to talk about memory tricks today. You weren't expecting this, probably, uh, but I thought it's a good lead-in and something light while you're working in your, uh, pres your presentation. What are some memory techniques that you know? Some, some memory techniques that you have used? Uh, can you think of some examples? 
Uh, why do they work? Why do memory techniques, memory tricks work? And there's a special term for these things that you'll see sometimes. It's mnemonics or mnemonics, actually. Usually the M is silent. Uh, some people say mnemonics. So MN at the beginning of the word MN, that's a funny spelling combination. Uh, so it's from Greek. So the word memory comes from uh, Latin, and Latin and Greek were cousin languages. So the word memory itself, I think, is from Latin. The Greek equivalent was this mnemon. <laughs> it's hard to say for English speakers, but they pronounce the mne, mne in Greek. Sometimes you see these funny letter combinations in academic words. It means they're from Greek. Um, I guess they have very uh, agile tongues. Um, so, uh, more, usually when you see MN, you pronounce the N, not the M. Uh, so some people might say mnemonics, but y the more common or standard pronunciation is mnemonics. Mnemonics, pronounce the N, mnemonics. So what are some memory tricks, memory techniques that you have used or that you know of and why do they work? Pause the video and discuss this. All right, first let's talk about why they work. They work because you're forming more connections. Memory works by forming connections. Maybe you've like crammed for an exam, like your TOEFL test by memorizing a lot of stuff. And then after the test is over, do you remember any of that? No, you forget it. Your brain throws out that information because your brain cannot really form any meaningful connections. You memorize these TOEFL words, uh, or if you're taking the GRE to get into graduate school in the US, GRE words. Memorize these words and then you forget. Your brain can't connect it to, with what it already knows. Your brain can't consolidate it and store it away in long-term memory. It's just a random fact. It doesn't belong anywhere. And so your brain is going to say, what is this? And it'll throw it out. And actually we know this from psychology research from a long time ago. We've known since the 1960s based on scientific research on memory and learning. This kind of rote memorization where you just memorize a lot of stuff doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work long term. You don't remember stuff like that. You, unless you just have a really good memory for that kind of stuff. But that means maybe your brain is good at finding somehow is able to make some connections. Because um, it's only by making connections that you remember things. Uh, so mnemonics or memory mnemonics, memory tricks, often involve creating um, more connections than usual. You you think of a, like a really funny visual image, and if it's strange or funny or very active or dynamic, it makes more connections in your brain. And we'll see some examples. So a lot of the examples that I will show you or that we'll talk about, just involve making um, a lot more connections than usual. Far more connections than you would just by rote memorizing, uh, rote memorization. Uh, lots of connections. So if your mnemonics, and especially using visual images, are really crazy or funny or strange or unusual or just very active or dynamic, that's great because that helps you remember. Thinking of like a, a visual image that's really strange, bizarre. Maybe you wouldn't want to share it with someone else. You wouldn't want to tell someone else, someone else how you remember their name. <laughs> but uh, it, it works. It really does. So some memory techniques or mnemonic techniques. What are some mnemonic techniques that you know of? Well, I'll, I'll talk about the ones that I know of. And the first one you probably know and you may have used. And by the way, some people use these a lot normally. If you go to medical school, medical students use these a lot because they have to memorize a lot of information and they have to be able to retain it. All kinds of information about the body. It requires lots of memorization. Or even if you, or if you major in biology, you have to memorize a lot of terminology, a lot. And, and biology students use these. I had to learn these when I was in middle school, eighth grade, uh, as a teenager. My, our biology teacher made us buy a book on mnemonic techniques. We had to, we were required to do so, and it was great that he did that. That's 
unusual. Not many public school teachers would do that because we had to memorize and kind of repeat a lot of stuff on his tests. What are the 10 characteristics of mammals? What are the eight characteristics of flatworms? Yeah, exciting stuff. And these techniques, I used them a lot in middle school uh, for this class, and I kept using them. Uh, and to, even to today, I can still use many of these techniques when I need to. I don't use them as much as I should, but when I need to, I, they, they work still. Very simple. So I'm going to talk about some of those techniques, including the techniques that I learned. And the, the first one is acronyms. And this is easy. Anyone can do this. You've probably done it. What is Holmes? Any idea what Holmes means? What about this name? Roy G. Biv. Who is that? Does that sound familiar? How about fanboys? Have you heard of that? If you learned English as a second language, you may know the fanboys one. Okay, so Holmes. Uh, so in American grade school classes, we have to memorize all 50 states and the capitals and things like the Great Lakes. So like between uh, the US and Canada, like Chicago, Ontario, uh, these five big lakes, we call them the Great Lakes. So we, HOMES is an acronym for Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, Lake Superior. They have to memorize that. Roy G. Biv, these are the colors of the co color spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. It's a very helpful acronym. By the way, indigo and violet, why are those separate colors? Should it just be purple? I mean, purple is kind of, indigo is kind of like a dark blue purple and violet is kind of like sort of purple or light purple. Why not just purple? That wouldn't make more sense. Well, you know who discovered the color spectrum? It was Sir Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton was a very religious man. Uh, he considered himself a Christian, although a lot of Christians would consider him a heretic because he um, didn't believe in the Trinity. Like, Christians, most Christians believe in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost are three separate things. He didn't believe in that. He's what we call a Unitarian who believes there's just um, a God of one single nature. So he kept that secret. So for centuries he was known as a devout Christian and in the um, early 1900s some of his personal letters were sold and made public and Christians, some Christians were shocked. Oh my God, he's a heretic. Anyway, so because Isaac Newton was religious, he wanted to make seven colors, seven. So it was only because of his religiousness that he split up purple into indigo and violet to make seven colors. It had to be seven. Uh, it would make more sense to have just purple and make it six. Uh, but too late to change. Maybe we can try to change it. But you know. Fanboys, you probably know. The basic coordinating conjunctions or main clause conjunctions, they join two main clauses. You know, a main clause, it can be a sentence by itself or you can join it with another main clause with for and not, but, or yet so, the fanboys. Um, and if you have some other good acronyms, uh, let me know. There are lots of them. You can do a Google search and find lot. there are lots more. Again, especially for medicine, memorizing medical terms and biology terms. Then there are sort of spelling or expression mnemonics where you um, take each letter and turn it into a different word and make a sentence that you can remember. So in biology, the different levels of the taxonomy. Taxonomy is like the classification of, of animals, uh, the different levels of classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So humans are homo sapiens. That's homo is the genus, species is the sapiens. Using a sentence like, kids prefer cheese over fried green spinach, that's a mnemonic device for memorizing the levels of the taxonomy. Order of math operations. Um, so you go, if you have a math expression, you first look at the stuff inside the parentheses, then the exponents, then multiplication, then division, addition, subtraction. So sometimes people use PEMDAS as an acronym. It doesn't make sense. It's not a word, but some people find that just that, just the PEMDAS acronym helpful. Or you can expand it to an expression like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And how do you remember the names of the planets of our solar system? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Well, my very educated mother just served us noodles. Now, back when Pluto was considered a planet, you know, there was a slightly different one. My very educated 
mother just served us nine pizzas or something like that. But now it's just noodles. Poor Pluto. Okay. There are good reasons for why Pluto is kind of demoted to a non-planet or minor planet status. We won't get into that. Uh, how about every good boy deserves fun? Do you remember that? I remember, I'm not a music person, I don't know music, but we did have to learn a little bit of music in grade school. Uh, I don't think it was, at least in my class, it wasn't taught terribly well in a very meaningful way, so I never remembered it. But the lines, the notes, uh, so on the lines you have the notes E, G, B, D, F, and for that we use every good boy deserves fun, and then for the notes and the spaces, furry, furry animals cook excellently. Mm, sounds appetizing. Rhyme mnemonics. Uh, have you tried to memorize like how many days are in each month? Uh, it's a little. If you don't know the pattern, it can be confusing. So uh, there's an old famous English poem uh, that uses this rhyme. So rhyme mnemonics. Uh, so 30 days, half September. So this is kind of older style. So an older style English, like around the time of Shakespeare and even a bit after that. Hath was has, so um, he hath, it hath. Uh, 30 days hath September, April, June, November, all the rest have 31. Save February, so save is an old, here it's an old preposition, preposition meaning except for. Save except for February with 28 days clear and 29 each leap year. Leap year is when we add the extra day in February. Uh, let's have to do some trivia here about months. Uh, I never found that mnemonic helpful. I, instead, I memorized a different version. 30 days hath September, all the rest I can't remember. Okay, it makes sense. Uh, in my case, uh, it, it's just more helpful to understand the concept. And sometimes understanding concept of behind something is more helpful. Um, if you take German, for example, you have to memorize all the, the noun and article declensions and Actually, there's kind of a principle behind it. it makes it much easier instead of just memorizing it. Uh, the calendar, do you know who made the calendar? The Western calendar? It was originally called the Julian calendar. It was later kind of revised and updated in the, I think the fifth century by, um, during the reign of Pope Gregory. So the modern calendar is the Gregorian calendar, but it's a re revision of the old Julian calendar because it's, it was devised by Julius Caesar, that guy. Now, Julius Caesar, before he became a political and military leader, for a while he served as kind of the high priest of the Roman religion in Rome. And, and as a priest, they dealt with calendars. I was, back then, um, something that the uh, uh, official, religious officials were in charge of, setting the calendar. So, because he was a high priest, of the Roman religion, the pagan Roman religion, uh, he learned an inf what they knew from Egyptian astronomy about the year, the moon and sun cycles. So he created a new calendar uh, based on his knowledge of Egyptian astronomy. And originally, uh, it was every other month had 31 days. So we go 31, 30, 31, 30. So starting with January. So January is 31 days. February was originally 30 days, but then they, that was too much days. So they decided to hack up February. Poor February got kind of picked on, bullied. Um, but other than that, it goes, you know, 31 and then a short month and then 31 in a short month. So uh, January, February, March, March, is thir has 31, April, May has 31, June, July has 31, uh, and August is an exception which we'll talk about. September has 30, October has 31, November 30, December 31. So it's kind of alternating. Now August is one exception, it has 31, why? Well, of course July has 31 according to the pattern. Uh, uh, and it was July's name for Julius Caesar. His son Augustus, so Augustus, August is named for his son Augustus. So um, a day was taken away from February and given to August in honor of Augustus. Because if Julius Caesar has 31, his son should have 31 to honor uh, Augustus. That's one reason February um, has uh, fewer days. 
so that August can have 31. So August is the one exception because Emperor Augustus had to be honored properly with, along with equal status as his father. By the way, just for fun, a few notes about the names of the month. September is from the Latin word for seven, even though it's the ninth month. Septum, seven. October, octo is eight. November, novem nine. December, decum, decim, ten. Why? The Julian calendar originally started with the new year, or the old, in the old Roman calendar before that started with the new, new year in March. So March 1st used to be the beginning of the new year. So September was the seventh month and October was the eighth and so on. Uh, then, the, then that was changed and January was made um, the first. And January was named after the Roman god of, new, of the new year, Janus or Jan Janus. Uh, so January, uh, so January was uh, named to reflect that. So because the beginning of the year was moved from March to January, um, that's why the m names of those months are the way they are. Back to mnemonics. There are musical mnemonics like you know the ABC song. Uh, there are a few of those. I think some good, some other good examples. Let me know. You know the ABC song. And there are um, kind of rhymes, rhyme mnemonics, not necessarily musical rhymes. So for example, for spelling rules. So for example, the spelling, when is it E-I or when is it I-E? For example, if you look at the words thief, priest, relief, yield, it's I-E, but C-E-I, 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 receive, deceive, sealing. So there is an old spelling rule mnemonic that we use I before E except after C, or when, or when sounding like A, as in neighbor and way. So when it's the A sound, it's E-I. So I before E except after C. Is it always true? No. It works better for words that are from Latin and French. Even then, it doesn't always work. There are a lot of exceptions. Uh, because the spelling is complicated, because we get words in English from different, many different languages, at different times, and so the spelling is complicated. So this doesn't always work. And in fact, because there are, some, there are so many exceptions that there are a lot of memes in social media that make fun of this rule. Uh, like science doesn't follow the rule, of course, because it's two-syllable science. Uh, and you'll f just Google search this rule and you find lots of uh, examples of people uh, playing with um, the exceptions. Uh, like this. And take a minute look at these. Um, there's so many exceptions that people kind of ha have fun making rule, making fun of this rule, I before E. Moving on, names and faces. I'm not really good at memorizing names and faces. I, would, I have to work on it. And it's, sometimes it's overwhelming when I have a hundred students a semester or in one time I had like 150, 200 a semester and it was overwhelming. I didn't try. But one thing you could do is you can think of a visual mnemonic, like think of how their face maybe reminds you of something that sounds like their name. Uh, so you can use a combination, you can use image mnemonics, a visual image, and or some kind of a sound-alike mnemonic. So for example, let's say you meet a guy named Reginald Barclay. He's actually a character from Star Trek. Uh, so imagine that his name sounds like register, like a cash register and broccoli. So you can imagine his face looks like broccoli, reminds you of broccoli somehow, create a visual image. Again, something silly, funny, but it works. The sillier, the crazier it is, the better it works to form connections and remember. So maybe you can imagine that he's at a cash register, working at a cash register and his face looks like broccoli. And this works, but just be careful. Don't actually confuse um, the mnemonic, the mnemonic with their actual name when, in, when you're talking to the person. Don't say, oh, hi, Mr. Broccoli. You know, don't, don't, don't confuse the mnemonic with the actual name. Uh, be, so be careful. Uh, I can do this because actually in a Star Trek episode, they made fun of his name. For numbers, well, when I was younger, I, we had to memorize telephone numbers. If, it's, it was, if it was an important telephone number, I, we had to memorize it. We didn't have smartphones to remember stuff like this for us. Nowadays, we don't have to memorize f phone numbers. 
but you may have to memorize other numbers. Well, you, you can kind of group the numbers together and find maybe mathematical patterns uh, in the numbers and that can help you remember things. I still remember my childhood phone number, 806-355-5364. I still remember that. That stays with you for all your life. Can't get that out of my head. Uh, so you can find like little mathematical patterns, this and this equals this, you know, adding the numbers together and such. Okay, that's, that's easy. You may have done that yourself. Visualizing maybe how you type it on a, uh, on a number keypad. You know, the, the movement of your fingers on the number keypad for some people that helps. Um, and then there's something called the PEG system, which I'll explain in a minute. So it might be the case that you need to memorize an, an ordered list of something. This is number one, this is number two, number three. Uh, it might even be the case that you have to memorize uh, a number, like a telephone number. Maybe it's an important telephone number you have to memorize. Well, you can use the PEG system.